Hey guys, this is Aaron Carmen from AXC Electronic, back with the next video in our circuit analysis lecture series. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going over some AC circuit analysis example questions. Now we're going to start off with five conceptual questions. These are just going to test your knowledge, your general intuition of AC circuits, and seeing if you know what some of these concepts are. And then we're going to have five where we're actually analyzing circuits. So you'll get to actually do the math and see how we're going to analyze these circuits. As always, I don't have any of these answers in front of me, so you're going to be seeing me solve these in real time, which I think is a good added benefit. You're not going to see me skip any steps. You're just going to see how I, as someone who has completed this coursework, uh, would solve these problems. Okay? So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with number one. So number one, we're going to identify or calculate, depending on whatever it is, the amplitude, frequency, angular frequency, period, and phase for the following time domain signal. Now, if you don't know what any of those things are, then go back to my previous video, and there was the AC circuits video where we talked about all of these concepts, where you learn what amplitude is, what frequency is, what period is, and what phase is, okay, because this is all stuff that's going to be important, and you need to be able to identify these in a time domain signal. So let's go ahead and start off with the amplitude. So remember that this is a sine wave that we're looking at. Even though it's a cosine function, a cosine function still follows sort of a sine wave pattern. So we're looking at a wave going up and down, oscillating as time goes on. Okay, so the amplitude is going to be how high does that wave reach? So what is the peak that that wave reaches? And in this equation, we can see that the amplitude is given by that number 10 right there. So 10 is going to be our amplitude. Okay, so that's amplitude down. What's going to be the frequency? Okay, so remember we said that frequency is going to determine how many times per second that this wave is going to oscillate, or how many times it's going to complete a full cycle in one second. Now you might be tempted to say, well, this is associated with T, you know, let me move to blue. You might be tempted to say, oops, you might be tempted to say that this one is associated with T, so this is probably the frequency. But remember, if we go back and look at our notes in the previous ones, we would see that here it's actually two times pi times the frequency. Okay? So if we want just the frequency, then we need to divide this by 2 pi. So we would do 30,000 divided by 2 pi, oh, and it's 30,000 pi divided by 2 pi, and then we would get 15,000, and that's the same as 15 kilohertz. Okay, so that is our frequency. So this wave is going to oscillate or complete one cycle 15,000 times every second. Okay, so now we've got the frequency. What's the angular frequency? Well, the angular frequency, remember, is just 2 pi times f, okay? That's how many radians it's completing per second, okay? So 2 pi times the frequency. And really, all that is is this right here, because we said before that that is 2 pi times the frequency. So this is going to be omega, our angular frequency. Now, just to make sure you know that that's not a w, that's an omega, a Greek letter, lowercase omega. And that's how we're going to denote angular frequency. Okay, so now period. So period is one we're going to have to calculate. So period t is going to be equal to remember 1 divided the frequent or divided by the frequency. Okay? So if we do 1 divided by the frequency, that's going to give us our period. Now, grab the calculator. So you can go ahead and do this one on your own if you've already got your calculator out and see how you're going to do, but remember, this is just going to determine how much time it takes to complete one cycle, okay? And the, the units for this is going to be seconds. So, if we were to do 1 divided by the frequency, what is our frequency? Well, we just said that our frequency is 15,000, so we'll do 1 divided by 15,000. Okay, and that's going to give us, oh man, it just keeps zooming out. So, that's going to give us 66.7 microseconds, okay? Or you could write this as 66.7 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Okay, it's up to you, but they're, you know, they're the same value. So how long is it going to take for it to complete one full cycle of this waveform? 66.7 microseconds. All right, and then the last thing we need is the phase. Okay, so I'm going to add a little bit of extra challenge to this problem. Phase, we, we know that phase can either come in radians or it can come in degrees. Right, because we, we've talked about kind of both of these, and we've shown both, or we're going to look at both representations. Well, here, whenever it's in the cosine function, and because it doesn't have a degree symbol, 
okay it doesn't have that degree symbol we know that this is in radians okay so if we want to know the phase phi this is going to be pi over six and I'll put radians here now how do you convert radians to degrees well 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees okay so if you need to go back and forth here let me I'll do this in black here you can say 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees okay. so then if we want to know degrees okay so then we just want to get degrees by itself divide both sides by 360 then we get pi over 180 times the value in radians is going to give us degrees that can't be correct okay I see. so yeah as you see me made a mistake here this is going to have a degree here degree here those two degrees are going to cancel out okay so then we're going to have there's pi radians per 180 degrees and that's one okay? and then what you can do is you can pretty much just rearrange this do the algebra and you'll find that if you have a value in radians you multiply it by a 180 divided by pi and that's going to give you the value in degrees okay so if we have the value in radians here pi over six i'm going to do 180 divided by pi times pi over six and that's going to give us 30 degrees so if it asked if it specifically asked for phase in degrees then you would say it's 30 degrees. If it said phase in radians, you would say pi over six. Okay, and we're gonna look at some more of these problems later just to make sure you have a solid understanding. I know I might've confused it a little bit there because I did the derivation wrong, but you know we're, we're gonna see that we can use this formula to go back and forth between radians and degrees. All right, so let me go ahead and erase this stuff since it's moving on to question two. So we're completely done with this first conceptual question. So now we can move on. So this one, we're going to be calculating the amplitude angular frequency, period, and phase for the following frequency domain signals. So for that previous one, we were in the time domain. Now we're in the frequency domain. Okay. So because we're in the frequency domain, we have to know at what frequency we're looking at. And that's why I gave you this problem here, 1500 hertz or 1 1.5 kilohertz, however you want to denote it. So we know that our F is equal to 1.5 kilohertz. So now, where do we have the amplitude on both of these signals or on both of these frequency domain representations? Well, if you go back and look at the previous videos, you'll see that amplitude is just these parts here. So the six and the four. So I'll just write that over here. That's amplitude. So our amplitude for the first one is six. For the second one is four. Now, angular frequency. Remember, angular frequency is omega, and that's just equal to 2 times pi times f. Okay. And if we plug this in, I'll do 2 times pi times 1.5 kilohertz. And that's going to give me 9.42. And that's times 10 to the 3. And this is going to be radians per second. Or if you want to write it a little bit cleaner, you could just say do the two times the 1.5 to give you um, 3,000 pi radians per second. Okay, and if you plug in 3,000 times pi, you'll get that it's equal to 9.42 times 10 to the three. Okay, so this is going to be our value of angular frequency here. Now the next thing is we're calculating period. Period t is equal to 1 divided by f and we know f so all we have to do is do 1 divided by 1500 and that'll give us 667 microseconds okay so the frequency here remember is 10 times less than it was in this previous problem in the previous problem we were doing 15,000 hertz now we're doing 1500 hertz okay so we have 10 times less frequency, that means we have 10 times more period. It's going to take 10 times as long to complete that one oscillation. All right, and so that sort of makes sense intuitively. Now, this is the same for both of these, right? Because we don't care about frequency, angular frequency, any of that stuff in the frequency domain. So this is the same for both of these. Okay. So now the last thing we're looking at is phase. 
Now, for each of these, I'm going to represent phase in degrees and radians. Okay, and then we're going to again practice how to go back and forth between the two. So for this first one, uh, let me, I'll do just a little block here. For this first one, we have that our phase from here, what is it equal? Okay, how can we tell phase from the frequency domain? Well, we just look at what's on the right side of that angle sign, and we'll see that for this first one, oh gosh, for this first one, the phase is equal to 30 degrees. Okay, now how do we convert that to radians? Well, we saw before that if we have radians, okay, we multiply by 180 divided by pi. So if we're going to go from degrees to radians, we multiply by pi and divide by 180. Okay, so if I wanted to know this phase in radians, I would just do 30 times pi divided by 180. And that's going to give me, let's see, that's going to give me 0 0.524 radians. And so that's how we go from degrees to radians. Now, for this next one, like I said, if we're not given a degree sign, then we can just assume that it's in radians. Okay, and for this one, we're not given a degree sign. So we know that this is going to be equal to pi over six, and that's in radians. So how do we convert that to degrees? If we wanna convert this to degrees, what are we gonna multiply or divide by? So since we're going to degrees, we're gonna multiply by 180 divided by pi. So if I do pi over six, let's see, pi over six times 180 divided by pi, that's going to give us 30 degrees. Okay, so you can see pi over six is the same thing as 30 degrees. So that tells us also that pi over six is the same thing here because we know here the phase is 30 degrees. So you can see that both of these have the same phase. They're just given in different representations. One's in radians and the other one is in degrees. Okay, so this is, these are the things that you can catch during this problem. And you need to make sure that you're uh, being diligent about those units because if you start mixing up radians and degrees then you're going to start doing all sorts of math wrong and that wouldn't be good. So now it looks like we've gotten everything for the second problem we can move on to the third. So this third problem we're going to convert the following time domain signal to the frequency domain. So how do we go back and forth from the time domain to the frequency domain? Well it's actually pretty simple okay so the only thing that we really care about like we said is amplitude and phase because we get rid of frequency whenever we go to the frequency domain and that's going to help make our calculations easier. So how can we convert this to the frequency do domain? So remember in the frequency domain we're going to use a big V all right? because we use the scripted V's for the time domain and the big capital V for the frequency domain. Well let's start off by figuring out the amplitude because that's something easy and we can see that it's just 17. The amplitude here is 17 so that's going to be the first number in our frequency domain representation. So what else do we need? Well, we're going to need the phase. So I'm going to go ahead and write that angle sign there because I know we're going to need it later on. Now, what in here, what in this whole cosine function is the phase? Okay. So we have this 10,000 pi times t on the right side, this 26 degrees on the left. You know, typically we see frequency on the left, so is this going to change anything? Well, the answer is no, it really doesn't change anything. You know, it's like saying two plus three is the same thing as three plus two. Okay, so we just have a frequency and a phase and we can identify that 26 degrees is our phase. So 26 degrees. Okay. So now I can represent this a different way, right? Because this is in degrees. What if I want to represent this phase in radians? Okay, well, the way I'm going to do that is that I'm going to, once again, the amplitude is going to stay the same. Oops, sorry. So the amplitude is going to stay the same at 17. And I'm going to use e to the j, right? Because you, you saw up here, whenever I was giving this representation, oh, whenever I was giving this representation up here, uh oh, did I freeze? Let's see, I think I might have frozen here. Oh, no, there we go. Okay. So up here, whenever I was giving this representation, whenever I was giving this representation up here and it was in radians or the phase was in radians, I used e to the j something, okay? e to the j something. And that's because for me, it sort of helps, it helps me separate between degrees and radians. So typically what I'm gonna do is 
If we're working with degrees, I'll use the angle sign. And if we're working with radians, then I'll use e to the j something. So for this one, how can we represent this in radians? Well, we just convert that degrees to radians. So how do we do that? Well, we have 26 degrees, and then we're going to multiply by pi. Multiply by pi, divided by 180, and that's going to give us 0. Oh, let me go to red. That's going to give us, man, it loves doing that, 0 0.454. Okay. And since I don't put a degree symbol there, it's in radians. Okay. So now we've converted this into the frequency domain, and we've actually done it two different ways. Okay. So now you know uh, how to tell the difference between these two representations. Okay, so now we have a frequency domain signal, and we want to convert this into the time domain. Okay. And because we're in the frequency domain, we have to have an extra bit of information. We have to know what the frequency is that we're talking about, okay. because frequency domain... Um, is only for a certain frequency. It's not for every single frequency. Okay, so it's only for, we need to know the certain frequency that we're interested in. So if we said that V is equal to 2.5 with a phase of 36 degrees, how would we convert this into the time domain? Well, we can start off by saying we know this is the amplitude here, 2.5. So we can do 2.5. Then everything else is going to be inside of a cosine. So I'm just going to go ahead and write a cosine and open parentheses. Now, typically we're going to write um, typically we're going to write the frequency first, then the phase afterward. But like I said, it doesn't matter if you want to do one way or the other. But you do have to have both of these. Okay, you have to have frequency and phase in the time domain. So how can we represent frequency here? Well, our frequency is sixteen thousand, and this is what this is going to be multiplied by t, right? Because it's cosine frequency times t. But remember, it's usually cosine omega t. So that means we have to represent this as an angular frequency in the cosine function. So what we're going to do is 2 pi times 16,000 t. And then we can add in our phase shift. So we can add in 36 degrees. Okay? So we can go ahead and simplify this. So it can be 2.5 cosine. Instead of 2 pi times 16,000, I'm just going to write this as 32,000 pi t. Okay, so now for me here, we have this whole 32,000 pi t, and this is going to be in radians, okay? Whenever you plug this into your calculator, this is typically going to be in radians, okay? So we want that phase to be in radians too, because otherwise it might get confusing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that into radians now. So I'm going to say 36. How do you convert to radians? You're going to multiply by pi. So 36 times pi divided by 180. Okay, and that's going to give us 0.628. Okay. So now this is our time domain signal, and we're working in radians, so this is just something you can plug directly into your calculator, and it'll plot it, it'll plot it for you. Alrighty, so now we have number five. So we're going to compute the following phasor calculations. Now you can try to do this by hand if you want to. We haven't talked about all the math skills that you might need in order to do it. So I'm just going to do this plugging it into my calculator. And I really encourage you to do these yourself with whatever calculator you have, because doing these yourself, what it's going to do is it's going to make sure that, for one, you know how to enter these into your calculator, and two, you're not going to freak out if you get something that you you know might not expect, because you're going to have exposure to this, and it'll just give you some practice as far as putting them in your calculator goes, because that can that can mess you up quite a bit. If you don't know how to put this stuff in your calculator on the day of the exam, then you might get in a whole lot of trouble. So let's start off with this first one, A. So what I'm going to do for me um, on my calculator, I can just put this directly in pretty much. Okay, You got to make sure, keep track of whether you're in degrees or radians mode on your calculator. Okay, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 16 angle, oh, so 16 angle 30. Okay, and then plus 13 angle negative 45. Okay, so remember, you can have a positive or a negative phase shift. Okay, it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter which one it is. You can have a positive or a negative. Okay, and then that's going to give me an answer that is 23 point, I'll just do 23.1. It's an angle of negative 
2.96 degrees. Okay. And I can convert this to radians how? I can convert this to radians by just keeping the amplitude the same, 23.1 e to the j. Now I have to convert negative 2.96 to radians, so I'm going to do negative 2.96 times pi, times pi, divided by 180. Okay, and that's going to give me negative 0 0.052 radians. Okay, so now these are this is two representations of that answer. I gave you both because I wanted to make sure that you were doing this correctly and getting the correct answer. So whether you're using degrees or converting this to radians first and then calculating, you know, whatever your calculator does, uh, you can know that you're getting the right answer. Okay. So now let's do this second one. So I'm just going to, I'm going to write it over here. So B. So this one is going to be 12 with an angle. Oops, let's see. 12. I have to do an open parenthesis on my calculator. 12 with an angle of 60. And then plus 12 with an angle of minus 60. Okay. So what is this going to give us? Well, it turns out it just gives us 12. Okay. So B is just going to give us 12. Okay. And you know, you can represent this 12 angle 0. So you can do 12 e to the j 0, or you can just do 12. It's entirely up to you. All three of those are correct. Uh, just make sure you know you're including your degree sign where it's appropriate. But I want you to think about this one real quick. So we have 12 pointed you know, upwards like this, and then we have 12 pointed downwards like this. Okay? And now if we add those two together, we have one going up 60 degrees, one going down 60 degrees. We just end up right back on that real axis. Okay? So that's what's going to happen with these. So if we have a 12 plus a degree, or 12 angle 60, plus 12 angle negative 60, that should end up right back on the real axis. Okay. And this is a special case. So you can't just generalize this to any problem, but I just think that that's something that's sort of interesting, that this one ends back up on the real axis. So now let's do C. Okay, so now this one is 14, oh, I keep forgetting that open parentheses, 14 with an angle of 27.5 degrees, plus three with an angle of 27.5 degrees, Got my open parentheses again. Okay, so now what's this going to give us? Well, the answer for this one is just seven or yeah, seventeen. Oh goodness. So the answer for this one is just seventeen with an angle of twenty-seven point five degrees. Okay. Now let me convert this into radians before we talk about it. I'll do twenty-seven point five times pi divided by one eighty. That's going to give us seventeen e to the j, that's 0 0.480, 0 0.480. So now let's think about this one, you know, because we have these angles, why does it just add up to be 17? Why does it have the same angle? Well, just think about it intuitively, you know, say that we have, we have one vector that's, you know, like we said, 14, with an angle of 27.5 degrees. Okay, so this is 14. And then we're adding another vector on top of that that has the same direction, right? So that angle is still 27.5 degrees and it has a length of three. So whenever they have the same angle, if we just add them together, then that's just going to give us, well, it's just gonna give us the sum of the amplitudes. Okay, so in this one we had 14 angle 27.5 plus 3 angle 27.5 and that just gave us 17 with a phase of 27.5. Okay, so you can actually generalize this to any problem. If I gave you 3 with a phase shift of 90 plus 4 with a phase shift of 90, that's just going to add up to 7 with a phase shift of 90. Okay, so there's some tricks like that that you can sort of commit to memory in order to maybe make these calculations a little bit faster or at least identify some tricks. Okay, but it never hurts to go back and double check yourself and make sure you're doing the math correctly and you know punch it into your calculator. So now let's do D. So D, we have nine with an angle of 24 plus 12 e to the j three pi over eight. Okay, so pretty clearly we have degrees and radians in this one. So how are we gonna handle this? 
Well, you pretty much have two options. You can either convert the degrees to radians, or you can convert the radians to degrees. Okay, either, either one is going to give you the same answer regardless. So let me go ahead and do that. So this is going to be, I'm going to convert it to degrees just because I'm already in degree mode and I've, it's made it a little bit easier. So I'm going to convert that 3 pi over 8 into degrees. So 3 pi over 8. How do we convert to degrees? What are we going to multiply by? We're going to multiply by 180 and then divide by pi. So that is going to give me an angle of 67.5 degrees. So I'm just going to make a note of that here to myself that that phase is 67.5 degrees. And then we just add them up. So I'll do 9 angle 24 plus, let's see, 12 with an angle this time of 67.5 degrees. I didn't punch that in right. 67.5 degrees. Alrighty. And this is going to give us 19.5 with an angle of 49 degrees. 49.0 degrees actually. And if we want to convert this to radians, let's just convert that 49 degrees to radians. So I'll do 49 times pi divided by 180. So that's going to give us that same 19.5 e to the j and that's 0 0.855. Okay, so this is degrees, that one's radians. So now this last one. This last one, we're actually in radians, so what would be easiest for me is just to add these two together in radians, okay, instead of having to convert both of them to degrees. So what I can do is I'm just going to change my calculator back to radians, and now I can start working with this. So I can say 16 e to the j, or it might be i on your calculator, it's i on mine. i and j are the same thing, it's just that whenever you're an electrical engineer working with current, it kind of helps to differentiate between the complex number and current. So we typically use lowercase j for the square root of negative 1. So for me it's 16 e to the j, and then pi over 2, and then minus 8, and then e to the j, and this one is just pi over 6. Okay. So in radians, this is going to give me 13.86 e to the j of 2.09 radians. Now how can I convert this into, excuse me, how can I convert this into uh, degrees? Well, we just take that 2.09 times 180 divided by pi. Okay. And that's going to give us, let's see, that's going to give us that same 13.86 with an angle of 120 degrees for this one. Okay, so let's think about this one because, you know, now we have this 120 degrees and we haven't really seen any phase that's more than 90. So if we think about this one, we have the 16 e to the j pi over 2, and if you convert that, that's actually 16 with a phase of 90. So we have this one, it's pointed all the way up here. This is 16. Okay. And then we're going to do minus e to the j pi over 6. Okay, so e to the j pi over 6 is going to point like over here. Okay. But now if we're going to do a minus, let me make sure I make this correctly. If we're going to do a minus, then what's going to happen is that it's actually going to point over here. So whenever we add those two together, or 16 minus this 8 e to the j pi over 6, we're going to end up, let me make sure, our result shown in the green is going to be somewhere over here. And you can see that the angle it makes is greater than 90 degrees. Okay, and that's, how, that's where we're getting this 120 degrees from. So this one makes a little more sense. You just have to think about it sort of conceptually and just justify it to yourself as you go. So this is the last one for the conceptual problems. Now we're going to move into actual circuit analysis. So I'm not going to detail as much of the uh, calculation for these because we're focused on just getting the right answer for all these voltages and currents. So instead, what I'm going to do is just kind of go through it a little bit quicker. Like I said, just not focusing on the math as much. 
and just trying to get that answer that we're looking for. So all the voltages and all the currents. So let's start off with number six. So number six, we have a source with an amplitude of 10, a phase shift of zero degrees. Then we have an eight ohm resistor and a 10 millihenry inductor. So 10 millihenries. Okay. So we can calculate the voltage. Okay, but how are we going to get the current for all of this? Well, uh, let me make sure I make a note of this first. Our frequency is 16 kilohertz. So how are we going to get the current? So if all we know is the voltages and the inductor value and the resistor value. Well, think about the last video we talked about, impedance. And impedance is going to relate voltage and current in the frequency domain. So all we need to do is calculate the impedance for both of these. So the first thing we should do is calculate the impedance. So if I do the impedance of the resistor, what's it going to be? Well, the impedance of a resistor, like we said in the previous video, is just going to be its value of resistance. So that's just going to be 8 ohms. Now, the impedance for the inductor, what is it going to be? Well, again, look back at that previous video. You'll find that the inductor uh, current and voltage have a phase shift of 90 degrees between each other. Okay, So its impedance is going to have to create that 90 degree phase shift. Okay, and it's going to have a J. Okay, an inductor and a capacitor both have a J in their impedances. Okay, and then we found out again in the previous video that it's J omega L. Okay, L is its inductance. What is omega? Well, omega is just the angular frequency like we've said before. So we can go ahead and calculate an angular frequency by just doing 2 times pi times F. So I'll make a note of that here. I'll just say omega is equal to... Uh, 2 times pi times f, that's just going to be 32 pi times 10 to the 3 radians per second. And I'm not going to write out the whole big long, or I'm not going to write out the whole equation because uh, it really would just take up a lot of space and I'm plugging this in the calculator anyway. So uh, if it asked you, you know, to give the actual value of uh, angular frequency, then you could write that out. But for now, I'm just going to leave it as 32 pi. So... Now that we know omega and we know the inductance value, we can calculate its impedance. So this impedance is going to be, let me go back to red. This impedance is going to be J times omega, which is 32, oop, 32 pi times 10 to the 3 times L, which is just 0 0.01. Okay, or you could do 10 times 10 to the minus 3, but that's what it ends up being. So, if we multiply these things together, we'll get 32 times pi times 10 to the 3 times 0 0.01. That's going to give us an impedance value of J1. That's well, actually just 1,005. So, 1,005. Okay. And since it's an impedance, okay, we've converted it from its inductance to its impedance. This one's also going to be in ohms. Okay, because ohms is what's going to relate voltage and current. Okay, so now, if we want to find the total current through here, so I'll call it I. If we want to find I, we're just going to do the voltage divided by the total impedance that the source sees. Okay, so I is going to be equal to the voltage of the source divided by Zn, okay, or the input impedance. Now, what's the input impedance? Input impedance is just the impedance of the resistor, in series with the impedance of the inductor, how do we add two impedances in series? Well, we just add them together. Okay, so this is going to be ZR plus ZL. Okay, so plug this down here. VS, like we said, is just 10, the angle of zero degrees. ZR is eight ohms, I believe. Yes, it's eight ohms. And then plus J1005 ohms. Alrighty, so what we get here is that we do 10 with an angle of 0, which 10 to the angle of 0 is just 10, so I'm just going to do 10 for my calculator, divided by 8 plus J 1005. Alrighty, and this is going to give me a value, let me see, this is going to give me a value of 0.1. 
You know what? I'm still in radians and I want to work with degrees right now, so let me recalculate this. All right, so this is going to give me a value of 9.95 times 10 to the minus 3 with an angle of minus 89.5 degrees. Okay. So that's the current flowing through this circuit. Let me make sure I copied everything correctly. Okay, and this is in amps. So this is the current that's going to be flowing through that circuit. So you can see it's 9.95 milliamps with a phase shift relative to the voltage source of minus 89.5 degrees. Okay. So we would say this current is lagging the voltage by 89.5 degrees. And that's quite a bit. You know, we said it just in an inductor by itself. In an inductor by itself, the current lags the voltage by 90 degrees. So what we can say is, what we can see is that this circuit is pretty, what we would call inductive. Okay, there's a lot of uh, contribution by that inductor, right? Because if we just had this 10 volts across an 8 ohm resistor, we would be getting pretty high, you know, we'd be getting pretty high current, you know, 1.25 or so amps or 1.2, you know, let me, let me just do the math, 10 divided by 8, we'd get 1.25 amps with no phase shift. Okay, but this inductor is creating a lot of phase shift and it's also reducing the current by quite a bit, you can see. Okay, so this is the current. So now we know the current through the entire circuit because there's no other branches or anything like that. Let's go ahead and calculate the voltage across the inductor. So the voltage across the inductor. Well, remember Ohm's law says V is equal to I times R. And if we use that in the frequency domain, that's going to say V is equal to I times Z instead of R because we're working with impedance. So this is going to be the current through the inductor times the impedance of the inductor. Okay, so the voltage across this inductor is going to be this current here, IL, we plug that in here. And then for ZL, ZL we calculated it up here. ZL is just J times 1005. Okay, so this is going to be, write it out, 9.95 times 10 to the minus 3, with an angle of negative 89.5 degrees, times this impedance, which is J, one. Zero, zero, 005. So if I just plug this into my calculator, 9, 9.95 times 10 to the minus 3 with an angle of negative 89.5 degrees times, if we do J1005, that's going to give us, let's see, that's going to give us the voltage across the inductor is equal to. 9.999, so I'm just going to say 10, and then with an angle of 0 0.5, not ohms, 0 0.5 degrees. Okay. So we have a 10 volt source, okay, and really, like I said, 9.999, pretty much almost exactly 10 volts is being dropped across that inductor. So we're expecting very little voltage drop across that resistor. You know, we already saw that there's very little current going through this circuit. Okay, so you can see that this inductor is actually preventing a lot of current from flowing in this circuit. Okay, and that's because if we calculate its impedance, it's pretty high. Okay, we have a 1005 ohm inductor impedance, okay, and then we only have an eight ohm resistor impedance. So that inductor is going to prevent current from flowing in this circuit. Okay. So now we found the voltage across the inductor we could find the voltage across the resistor pretty easily by just doing V is equal to I times R or I times ZR, which is just R. Um, but in, we know the voltage here. We know the voltage here. I'm going to say that this circuit is completely solved. Okay, so we're done with this one. So now let's move on to number seven. So number seven is going to be, again, a sinusoidal source. source. All of these are going to be sinusoidal. And then we're going to have an 8 milli Henry inductor, a 6 ohm resistor, and a 1 milli Henry inductor. Okay. So this one is definitely a little more complicated. Frequency for this one is going to be 600 hertz. Okay. And let me say this is 1 milli Henry, this is 8 milli Henrys, and this is 6 ohms. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to first solve for the current flowing through this circuit. Now, how can we do that? 
Well, we can do that by simply working with the impedances. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to convert everything into an impedance. And you'll see I'm going to do something that's a little weird whenever I convert this into impedance. And I'll explain it why after I do this. Okay, so we're going to have this source, 3, with an uh, angle of 0 degrees. Let's convert this first inductor into an impedance. So let's do ZL1. Remember, ZL is just J omega L. And I'm just going to plug this into my calculator. I'm going to do... Um, 2 times pi times our frequency, which is 600, and then times its inductance, which is 8 millihenries. And what that's going to give me is J30.2 ohms. Now, you'll see I converted this into a box, and the reason I did that is because we're about to start combining uh, resistors, inductors, and things like that. And since this is going to require multiple steps, Okay, I just want to use everything as a box. We can't, we can't, we don't know what's inside that box, but all we know is it's impedance looking in. Okay, because if we have, you know, say a box that's a resistor and an inductor, then it's going to have an impedance that can't really be described by only a resistor or only an inductor. Okay, so that's why I'm switching all these to boxes. Now, the 6 ohm resistor is pretty easy. It just has an impedance of 6 ohms. And then now, we have to convert a 1 millihenry inductor into an impedance. So I actually still have it stored in my calculator from the last time. I'm just going to change 8 millihenry into 1 millihenry. So this one is going to be 3, oh, forgot my J. J times 3.77 ohms. Okay. So now we have everything converted into an impedance. Now we can start calculating things in this circuit. So Let's calculate, well, we have these two impedances in parallel. Let's calculate that one. So this is going to be 3, 0. This first impedance, which we said we haven't changed it yet, so it's still J, 30.2 ohms. Now we're going to have this new impedance, which is that resistor, or the, the two impedances in parallel. So how do we calculate that? Well, it's just going to be the impedance of the first one, so 6, times the impedance of the second one, so times J, 3.77, and then over the sum of that, so 6 plus J, 3.77. So what that's going to give me is that is going to give me an impedance of, well, let me, let me see. So that is going to give me an impedance of 3.19 with an angle of 57.9 degrees. Okay. So I'm trying I'm going to keep it in that form where it's with the angle sign, okay, because that's something that we've talked about before. There's a bunch of different forms for complex numbers, but this is the one that I'm going to use. Okay. So now we just have two um, impedances in series. So we can do J30.2. Oh, J30.2 plus this impedance here, so that's 3.19 with an angle of 57.9. If we do that, we'll get our end circuit, which is going to be that single source with a single impedance. And this equivalent impedance is going to be 32.946. So 32.946 with an angle of 87.1 degrees. Okay, so now we have just an equivalent impedance. We can use V is equal to I times Z in order to get the current that's leaving that source. So this is going to be just IS, I'll call it IS. IS is going to be equal to the voltage of the source, so three, let me make sure I use my, putting this in correctly, three with an angle of zero divided by that impedance. So that's going to be divided by 32.946 with an angle of 87.1 degrees. And what we'll find is that IS is going to be equal to 91 times 10 to the minus three with an angle of negative 87.1 degrees. So once again, 
we have a pretty inductive circuit because that phase shift is pretty close to, or the phase shift for the current is pretty close to negative 90, meaning the current is lagging the voltage by almost 90 degrees. Okay, and then what we can also see is that, you know, this resistor has an impedance of 6 ohms. This inductor on the, or on the right has an impedance of 3.77. But then this first inductor, that 8 millihenry inductor, has a pretty high impedance compared to everything else. So we're expecting that inductor to sort of dominate, and that's what it's doing. And it's limiting the current that's going through this circuit. Okay, So that explains why we have sort of a lower current, and uh, we have that lower current and that pretty high phase shift. Okay, so now that we have gotten to this point, we have IS. Okay, so we have IS. Let's calculate the voltage here. Okay, so how can we calculate the voltage there? Well, that's just going to be IS times this impedance. So let's do that. We know IS is 91 times 10 to the minus 3 with an angle, oop, I put that in the wrong space, with an angle of negative 87.1 degrees and then we're going to say times okay we're going to say times right yeah so yeah we're going to say times 3.19 with an angle of 57.9 and i forgot my open parentheses again but once we multiply those two things together we will get okay the voltage here i'll call oh See, I'm using those script letters again. We need to use a big V. So this V1 is going to be equal to 0 0.29 with an angle of negative 29.2 degrees. So we can see that voltage has already dropped considerably after it goes through that first inductor. And again, that's because it is providing a pretty big impedance. Okay, so you can think of that if you if you want to relate this back to DC circuits. If we have a big resistance followed by a small resistance, most of the voltage is going to be dropped across the big resistance. Same thing here. If we have a big impedance followed by a smaller impedance, most of the voltage gets dropped across that big impedance. Okay, so now we know the voltage here, V1, and we know that V1 is equal to that voltage here in our original circuit. So now let's calculate... I1 and I2. I1 is going to be easy because it's just Ohm's law. It's going to be V1 divided by R, which is 6 ohms. So we can write this as V1 is 0.29 with an angle of negative 29.2. Okay. Wait on. Yeah, so with an angle of negative 29.2. And then, okay, so then we're going to be multiplying that, by, or sorry, dividing that, excuse me, we're going to be dividing that by 6 ohms. And then we're going to get that the current is 48.33, I'm just going to do 48.3, with an angle of negative 29.2. Right, okay. So that resistor doesn't provide any phase shift. Okay, and I'm sorry, I'm having to sort of stop and just check myself because these circuits are sort of complicated to work out by hand. So I like to stop and check myself, make sure I'm telling you the correct answers. So now let's calculate I2. Well, once again, it's just going to be V1, except now we're going to do divided by that impedance. Okay? So that's going to be V1, which again is 0 0.29 with an angle of negative 29.2. And then we're going to divide that by the impedance, which is going to be J, let me make sure I'm doing this here, J times 3.77. And what we'll find is that this is going to be equal to, let me see here. Yeah, so what we'll find is that this is going to be equal to 0 0.076, 0 0.077 actually, with an angle of negative 119.2 degrees. Okay, so just to make sure I'm doing everything correctly, I'm gonna make sure, you know, we know that the total current is entering here, or IS is entering here, and it's being split into two branches. So I wanna make sure that I1 plus I2 equals IS. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. 
oh, I said that this was 48.3. There should be a times 10 to the minus 3 here. Okay. <laughs> Let me move that over. So what we're missing here is a times 10 minus 3. We're not getting 48 amps out of this. So I'll do 48.3 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay. The negative 29.2 phase shift plus this 76 with the negative 119 phase shift. Okay, and that's going to give us, let me see, that's going to give us just about 91 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, with the phase shift of negative 87.5. So that's going to, you know, it's within a rounding error estimate because I've been rounding throughout this. So we've done this pretty well up until this point. Okay, so now we've calculated the voltage and the current everywhere in the circuit. And you've gotten a little bit of experience with combining these impedances. Okay. So now the circuit is solved. Let's move on to number eight. So number eight. Number eight is actually a capacitive circuit. Okay, It doesn't have any inductors in it. It's all capacitors. Well, it's all capacitors and resistors. So we have our source, which is 16 with an angle of zero degrees. A... 10 microfarad capacitor, a 7 ohm resistor, connection back to source, and then over here we have a 1 ohm resistor and a 1 microfarad capacitor and a frequency equal to 1 megahertz. Okay, so 1 million hertz. So this one's 1 microfarad, this is 1 ohm, this is 7 ohms. So now we can start solving this circuit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to sort of do two steps in one. Okay, so I'm going to combine these two impedances into a single impedance and then also convert everything else into their impedances. Okay, so let's start off here. We have this 16 with a zero degree phase shift source. Now let's convert this capacitor into its impedance. Now how do we convert capacitors into impedance? Well, <clears throat> if you look back at the previous video, you can see it's going to be 1 over j times omega times c. So if you plug that in, 1 divided by j times omega, so omega is 2 pi times 1 megahertz, or 1 million, and then times c, which is 10 times 10 to the minus 6. So what we can see here is that this capacitor, let me make sure I'm doing this correctly. Okay, so this capacitor is going to be minus j, and 0 0.016. I'm bad at rounding today. So 0 0.016. Now something that's interesting to note is that the impedance of a capacitor, you know, the impedance of an inductor was positive J. Now the impedance of a capacitor is negative J. So if we are just looking in at something and it has a negative imaginary component or a negative J, we can say automatically that it looks like a capacitor or it's capacitive because of that negative J. Same way, if we're looking at an impedance and it has a positive J, then we can say it's inductive because it has that positive imaginary impedance. So let's continue on by doing the seven ohm resistor because it's the easy one. It's just seven ohms, all right? And then that goes back to the source. Now, like I said, I'm going to combine these two impedances in one step. So we have a one ohm resistor, okay? So we have 1 ohms, plus what is the impedance of that capacitor? Well, again, it's going to be 1 divided by J times omega times C. And C, in this case, is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 6. So what this is going to give us is this is going to give us negative J 0 0.16. Okay. You can just write this as 1 ohm minus J 0 0.6. And if I do that in my calculator, 1 minus J 0 0.16, and that's going to give us 1.01 .01 with an angle of negative 9.1 degrees. So that's the impedance there. So now all we have to do is combine these two impedances in parallel. Okay, that can be our next step. So then we're going to move move down here and we'll have a 16 volt source the same impedance here because we haven't changed it minus j 0 0.016 and then 
we're going to have just a single impedance that is equivalent to those two here in parallel. Now, how do we do that? Well, we just use the parallel impedance formula that we talked about before, which is the same for a parallel resistor formula. So I'm going to do 7 times 1.01. I'll do 7 times 1.01 with an angle of negative 9.1. And then we're going to do divided by 7 plus that 1.01 with an angle of negative 9.1. Let me make sure I entered that in my calculator correctly. Okay, cool. So we're golden. So now this equivalent impedance is going to be 0 0.883 or 884 with an angle of, so that angle is going to be negative 7.96 degrees. Alrighty. So now we have just two impedances in series. Convert this again into just a single impedance. So 16 angle of zero. Now this single impedance is going to be the sum of these two. So I'll do that impedance that we got before plus, and it's plus negative J 0 0.016. And what that is going to give us is our final impedance, which is, oh gosh. That's going to give us our final impedance, which is grand finale, is going to be 0 0.886 with an angle of negative 8.98 degrees. Yes, okay. So now we can calculate the current because we just have a voltage and a current, or a voltage and an impedance. So we can calculate this IS. So IS is going to be equal to VS divided by the impedance. So that's going to be 16 divided by its impedance, which is 0 0.886 uh, with an angle of negative 8.98 degrees. And I always forget. Oh, no. So this is going to be, goodness, okay, this is a lot of current in this one. 18.1 with an angle of 8.98 degrees. Okay, so if we look in at this, we're going to have actually a pretty high current. Okay, so the inductors, they didn't like having their current change. Capacitors, they don't have any problem with it. Okay, so we have a really small impedance here, a really small impedance for this capacitor here. So the capacitors really don't mind, uh, really don't mind this AC. So now we know the current IS. Well, if we come here, now we can calculate V1. Okay, so how do we calculate V1? That's just going to be IS times that equivalent impedance. So I'll do that right now. That'll be 18.1 with an angle of 8.98 degrees. And that's going to be times 0 0.884 with an angle of 7.8. Oh, negative 7.96 degrees. And what that's going to give me is, let me make sure, V1 is equal to, I'll just write it over here. That's going to be 16 point, wait, that can't be correct. No, well, it's in, it's a rounding error. All right. So that's going to be equal to 16 with an angle of 1.02 degrees. Now, like I said, uh, uh, there's a couple of rounding errors here. If you do this exact, you'll find that it's different. But look, we have this really tiny impedance here, right? And that really tiny impedance is not going to drop the voltage very considerably. So that's why we have the same voltage here that we have to supply. Okay, And it's just slightly phase shifted by one degree. Okay, so that's our V1. Now, if we go up here, we know this is V1, and we know this is V1. Okay, So now let's calculate the current through the resistor. I'll call this I1. I'll call this one I2. So let's start off with I1. So I1 is just going to be V1 divided by the resistance. Okay, so if I do that, that's just going to be 16 divided by 7. Okay, and if you, you're going to plug this in, but you're going to get 2 point, let's see, 2.9, 2.29. Okay, 
and this is going to have an angle of 1.02 degrees. Okay, so the current and voltage are in phase for that resistor. Now I2 is going to be V1 divided by that impedance. Okay, so if we do that, we're going to get uh, 16 with an angle. Let me see, where is that at? 16 with an angle of 1.02. And then that's going to be divided by that impedance, which is 1.01 .01 with an angle of negative 9.1. So now what we're getting is that the current is 15.84 with an angle of 10.12 degrees. Okay. So the current is leading the voltage in uh, in this impedance, right? Because remember, we said it's capacitive, and capacitors have their volt or they have their current leading their voltage. So I'm just going to sanity check myself here, and I'm going to make sure I1 plus I2 equals IS, just to make sure I'm doing this correctly. So I'm going to do 15.84 uh, with an angle of 10.12 plus this 2.29. Let me make sure I'm getting that correctly. Okay, so plus this. 2.29 with an angle of 1.02. Okay. What I find that that's equal to, okay, 18.1 with an angle of 8.98. Okay, so we did this pretty good. So right now we're sanity check to make sure that we're uh, this problem is still making sense and we haven't done anything we're not supposed to. So the last thing is we know that here this is V1. This is V1. Let's find this voltage here that I'll call V2. So V2 is just going to be equal to, once again, that current, I2, times the impedance of the capacitor. Okay? And remember, the impedance of the capacitor is 1 over J omega C, or that's negative J 0 0.16. Okay, so I pulled that from here. Okay? So let's do that. So let's do the current, which is, okay, so that current is going to be 15.84 with an angle of 10.12. And then we're going to do times negative, negative J 0 0.16. And what we'll find is that the voltage across that capacitor, okay. So the voltage across that capacitor is going to be 2.5 with an angle of negative 79.9 degrees. Okay, so the voltage and current are still out of phase, 90 degrees out of phase. Okay, but you'll notice that the voltage across that capacitor is pretty small compared to the resistor. Okay? So now we have the voltage everywhere in this circuit. We have the voltage and we have the current everywhere in this circuit. We have managed to completely solve this circuit. So we've done a pretty good job on this circuit so far. Okay? So now let's move on to number nine. Now you can see that these are getting you know, pretty complicated. And these are kind of long and drawn out. And the reason for that is because you have to take a lot of time, enter things in your calculator, double check and make sure you're entering things correctly. Because like I said, a calculation error can and will kill you on a, any sort of test or something like that. So you have to make sure you're sanity checking yourself periodically through these problems. Okay, so now let's do this next problem. So this one has a source with eight with a 90 degree phase shift. So right off the bat, we can see that this is a little bit different. Well, how is this going to affect things? Really, it's not. It, you just have to account for it in your problems. Okay, so whenever you're plugging in Vs, instead of just doing 8 with an angle of 0, you would do 8 with an angle of 90. Okay, and the math manages to work itself out. So this is just something that you have to keep in mind. Just make sure you plug in that 90, and you're going to get everything correct. Okay. And then we have a 3-ohm resistor a two microfarad capacitor, a six millihenry inductor, and an 18 ohm resistor. So an 18 ohm resistor, six millihenry inductor, and the frequency is going to be 18 kilohertz. All right, so let's start off converting everything into its impedance first. And that's, just, that's the thing we typically always do. So we're going to have eight, an angle of 90 degree source. 
That resistor, what does that impedance turn into? Well, its impedance is just 3 ohms. Now, this capacitor, what is its impedance? Well, remember the formula for a capacitor's impedance is 1 divided by j omega c. So if I plug that in, 1 divided by j, oop, 1 divided by j times 2 pi, because we're doing omega, times 18,000, okay, and then times c. Now that capacitance is just 2 microfarads, so 2 times 10 to the minus 6. And that's going to give me an impedance of negative j, and this is 4.42. So negative j, 4.42 ohms there. So that's the impedance of the capacitor at this frequency. So now let's look at the inductor. Actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing I did last time, which is just combine those that those two series impedances, the 6 millihenry inductor and the 18 ohm resistor, into one. Just sort of skip a step. Makes it a little bit e shorter for me because this video is already getting pretty long. Oh, yeah, we're already over an hour. Goodness. Okay, well, so for this one, we're going to have a 6 millihenry inductor, and the impedance of an inductor is J times omega times L. So I'll do J times 2 pi times 18,000, and then times L. And L is just 6 times 10 to the minus 3. And then we're going to do plus that 18 ohm resistor. So I'm just going to do plus 18 here. And what we'll find is that this impedance, the total impedance of the two, is going to be, let me make sure I entered everything in correctly, this impedance is going to be 678, and I'll just do 679, 679, with an angle of 88.5 degrees. All right, so what can we do with this now? Well, we have these two impedances in parallel. Let's simplify those. You can see that these are all following a pattern. Maybe I, maybe one person wrote them all. I'm not sure. But we can see. That was a joke, by the way. I wrote all of these. So I guess I had a constant idea in my head of what I was wanting to do. So this first impedance stays the same as 3 ohms. This next impedance is going to be negative j. Wait, no, we're combining that thing. Got ahead of myself there. So these two impedances in parallel, we're just going to use the parallel impedance formula. So this is going to be negative j 4.42 times 679 with an angle of 88.5 divided by the sum of those two. So let me make sure negative i 4.42 plus 679 with an angle of 88.5. Okay, and I entered everything in correctly. Yes. So this impedance is going to be, whoop, this impedance is going to be 4. Point, let's see, 4.45. Okay, and then with an angle of negative 89.99 degrees. So think about it. we have this very small capacitive impedance in parallel with a pretty big inductive impedance. So what's that going to look like if we put those two in parallel? Well, really, all we're going to see is the smallest impedance. So that's why this thing is looking pretty capacitive, okay? So right now, what we've got is this or this uh, pretty capacitive impedance looking in. Let me make sure I did that correctly. Okay, 4.4. Okay. So then all we need to do now, last step, is going to be putting these two impedances in series into one. So this is 8, 90 degrees. Now this is going to be... 3 plus that previous answer that we got, and that's going to be 5 point, oh goodness, 5.37 with an angle of negative 56 degrees. Now we have enough information to calculate the current. So let's calculate this current, IS. So IS is going to be equal to, remember we have that 90 there now, so it's 8 with an angle of 90 divided by the impedance, which is 5.37 with an angle of negative 56. And this is going to give us IS is equal to 
four, nine, with an angle of 146 degrees. So like we said, this impedance is capacitive. So we're expecting the current to lead the voltage this time. And we can see that it is because it has the higher phase shift than the initial voltage, right? The initial voltage has a phase shift of 90. This one has, a, or the current has a phase shift of 146. All right, so now that we know IS, let's come back up here, calculate V1. So V1 is just equal to IS times Z. And if we do 1.49 with an angle of 146, make sure I'm entering that in correctly. Oops. All right. This is going to be 1.49 with an angle of 146 times that impedance, which is 4.45 with an angle of negative 89.99. All righty, so that's going to give us, was it 89.99? That doesn't seem, okay, it was. So that is going to give us, the voltage is equal to 6 point, let me make sure. Yeah, the voltage is equal to 6.63 with an angle of 56 degrees, okay? So remember, like we said, this one is pretty capacitive, right? So that means the voltage is going to lag the current. So the current is 146, and this is really almost exactly like a capacitor because it's just a very small capacitive impedance in parallel with a larger impedance. So it's pretty much almost capacitive and we're expecting it to be 90 degrees out of phase, which it pretty much is, all right? So that's our V1. So now let's come up here. We know that this is V1, this is V1. Let's calculate I1 and I2. So I1 is just V1 divided by its impedance. So I1 is going to be 6.63 with an angle of 56 divided by that impedance, which is negative j 4.42 and that's going to give us 1.5 with an angle of 146 degrees all righty and now i2 i2 is going to be that v1 so 6.63 an angle of 56 6.63 angle of 56 then divided by 679 with an angle of 88.5. All righty, so what are we getting here? So this is going to give us pretty small, 0 0.009, I'll do 9.8, with an angle of negative 32.5 degrees. All righty, again, let's sanity check ourselves. Let's do 1.5 with an angle of 146 plus that, uh, that current that we just calculated to make sure we're getting the right values. And it looks like, let me see here. Oh yeah, I didn't look down far enough. So it looks like we're doing everything correctly at this point. I got 1.49 with an angle of 146. So it looks like we're doing everything correctly at this point. So now the last thing we need to do is that we said, you know, this is V1. We know I1, we know this is I2. Okay. Let's calculate this voltage here, V2. So that voltage V2 is just gonna be I2 times the resistance. Okay, so if I do I2 okay, times that resistance, which is 18 ohms, I'm going to get a voltage here. So V2 is equal to 0 0.176 with an angle of negative 32 point five degrees okay so the voltage is exactly in phase with that current so now we know the voltage we know the current everywhere in the circuit but we got this one done and notice this one even had capacitors and inductors in it so now we're getting combinations of the two so now let's move on to this last one so this last one we are given so this is number 10 by the way so this last one we are given again a source except now it's not given to us in the frequency domain. It says 10 cosine 2000 pi plus 35 degrees. 
Okay. And then we have this six ohm resistor, a three millihenry inductor in series with an eight ohm resistor. So this is three millihenries. This is eight ohms. And then a 30 microfarad capacitor in parallel with all of that. Now, notice we're not given a frequency. That's because we're given the voltage value in the time domain. Okay, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find frequency ourselves. So from this, we can see that omega is 2000 pi. Oh, I forgot a t here. 2000 pi t plus 35 degrees. So we can see that our omega is 2000 pi. And really, we don't need frequency because all of our calculations involve omega. So I'm just going to keep that here. Omega is equal to 2000 pi, and we're good. So let's go ahead and convert to the frequency domain. And while I do that, I'm also going to convert everything into an impedance. So the source is easy, right? So this is just 10 with an angle of, what's its angle? It's 35 degrees. Now, this resistor, again, is easy. So it's just going to be 6 ohms. Now, I'm going to go ahead and combine that inductor and resistor here. Let's calculate this first impedance, and then I'll put this one all the way over here. That way we have room for our numbers. So, inductor plus a resistor. What's the impedance of an inductor? That's just going to be J omega L. So, if we want to calculate this total impedance, it's going to be J times omega, which is 2000 pi. And then times 3 millihenries, so 3e minus 3. That's j times omega times l. And then we're going to add that 8 ohm resistor in series in. So what I'm going to get is that this impedance is equal to 20.48, an angle of 67 degrees. Now this capacitor... This capacitor is just going to be 1 over j omega c, so 1 divided by i times 2000 pi times c, which is 30 times 10 to the minus 6. This is going to give me 5.3 with an angle of negative 90 degrees. Or you could also just write this as negative j 5.3. It's up to you. It's, it's the exact same thing. So, once again... We have two impedances in parallel. So we can use the parallel impedance formula to get an equivalent impedance. So this is going to be source, this resistance, which is 6 ohms. This is 10 with an angle of 35 degrees. Now, we're just going to have this equivalent impedance here. And this is going to be 20.48 times 5 point, uh, that 5.3 angle minus 90, and then divided by the sum of those two. What that's going to give us is, let me make sure I got everything in there right. All right, so what that is going to give us is an equivalent impedance of 6.9 with an angle of negative 82 degrees. Okay. So now let's just do 6 plus that to get the total impedance. So 10 angle, 35 degrees. And we're just going to have a single impedance now. And this is going to be 6 plus whatever it was that we found. And that's going to be 9.73 with an angle of minus 44 degrees. Oh, goodness. I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm terrible at rounding. So this is going to be minus 45 degrees. All right, so 9.73 with an angle of minus 45 degrees. That is going to be the total impedance that we see looking into this circuit. So now, like we have been for the last problems, we can calculate the current. IS, so IS is going to be equal to BS divided by that Z. That's going to be 10 with an angle of 35 divided by z, which is that 9.73 number. And that's going to give us 1.03 with an angle of 79.7 degrees. All right, so now we know IS. We can calculate here V1. 
So V1 is going to be equal to IS times this impedance. So that's going to be 6.9, or it's going to be IS, which is that 1.03, times that 6.9 number, 6.9 with an angle of minus 82. So if I plug that in, what I'm going to get is the voltage there is equal to 7.1. It's an angle of negative 2.7 degrees. Okay. Now let's just keep on going. We know that v, V1 is here and V1 is here. So now we can calculate the current I1 and I2. So let's calculate I1. I1 is going to be equal to V1 divided by this impedance, 20.48 with an angle of 67. So I'm going to get, let's see. So that's going to be V1, which is 7.1 with an angle of minus 2.7 divided by that 20.48 with an angle of 67 number. So instead of typing that in, I'm just gonna go up and find it in my calculator. And that's going to give me 0 0.347 with an angle of minus 69. Let me make sure I'm getting everything. 69.7 degrees. All right, so that's I1. I2 is going to be V1 again divided by 5.3 with an angle of minus 90. So that's going to be V1, which is 7.1 with an angle of minus 2.7 divided by that 5.3 minus 90. And that is going to give us 1.34 with an angle of 87.3 degrees. Okay. So for this current, it's actually going to be leading the voltage, whereas in the previous one, the current was actually lagging the voltage. Okay, so that's how we can tell that there's probably an inductor in here and probably a capacitor in that right one, which, as we know, is correct. Okay, so now we know here, we know V1, we know V1 here, so we know the voltage across that capacitor. We can calculate the voltage across that resistor. The only thing we don't know is V2 right there. So V2 is just going to be I1, times that resistance R. So just times 8 ohms. I1 was 0.347. Let me go up and just find that. So 0.347 should be here somewhere. Oh, I think on my calculator it shows it's 347. I might have deleted it. I'll just punch it in. So 0 0.347 and then with an angle of negative 69.7, and then times eight ohms. That's going to give us 2.78 with an angle of minus 69.7 degrees. Alrighty, I just realized I didn't sanity check my numbers, so I'm gonna do I1 plus I2, so that's 0 0.347 with an angle of minus 69.7 plus 1.34 with an angle of 87.3. And that's going to give me 1.03 with an angle of 79.7. Boom, we did everything correctly. So we, we at least did our currents correctly. So again, now we know voltage and current everywhere in this circuit. Okay, and notice that we weren't even starting off in the frequency domain. We started off in the time domain. So that was sort of the trick to this problem, was converting this problem to the, or to the frequency domain, identifying what your omega is, and then using that to make all these calculations. So guys, this was a pretty long video. You know, we're coming up on an hour, or we're coming up on an hour and 24 minutes just now. So if you stuck around, really great job because you did a lot of these problems and these are not easy problems. You know, this is typically the last couple of weeks of a circuits one course at the collegiate level. So if you're working out these problems and getting correct answers and you're not a college student, great job. Even if you are a college student, awesome job because this is confusing and complicated stuff. It's bonus points if you're understanding the intuition behind what is happening here. Okay, because that's something that typically doesn't come for a while. Okay, so getting an intuitive understanding can really help you get these problems and understand what's going on and maybe catch yourself with some mistakes.
And I also encourage you, if you got a different answer and you can justify it, let me know. It's like I said, I'm working these out in person. I don't have the answers in front of me. So it is entirely possible that I made a mistake even though I was sanity checking my numbers. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions or concerns, leave them in the comments below. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe for more of this content. Uh, up next, we're going to be looking at an LP Spice tutorial once again, just to check and see how can we simulate these circuits in LP Spice. Okay, and so that one's going to be a pretty informative video. You're going to learn some good stuff and learn how to simulate these circuits to verify that you're doing things correctly. But yeah, guys, like I said, leave your comments below if you've got any questions or concerns. I guess that must mean it's my time to go. My fire alarm just went off. So guys, enjoy yourselves. Like I said, like my content, subscribe for more. Otherwise, I'm Aaron Carmen, and thank you for watching.